on my mark, get set. You want the American dream. You want the life, the liberty, the happiness. But until you get there, until you achieve your goals and make your dreams come true, you know what you have. You have the journey, the hustle, the climb. I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is The Pursuit. Today we are in Enid, Oklahoma, which is a small town about two hours or so from Oklahoma City. As you can imagine, there's just really not that much to fill my monologue with about Enid, Oklahoma, but it is the home of Vance Air Force Base, where one third of the Air Force pilots get their training, and it is kind of a hub of the grain industry and the oil industry, go figure, and it's actually the home of one of the last remaining American manufacturers of fireworks, which I find kind of disturbing that on Independence Day we're shooting off explosives that were made in other countries. <laughs> Something about that just doesn't sit right with me. I really hope to get through an Oklahoma episode without mentioning food, but it turns out that Enid is the is the number one producer of Philly cheese steaks in the US, beating out, yes, Philadelphia, because of Advanced Pierre Food Company, which is a big food distribution company, and also produces a lot of school lunches for schools in the United States. Isn't that interesting? And last but not least, one of the most interesting facts about Enid was that it was mentioned in season three of CBS's The Big Bang Theory. Sheldon says he wants to leave California and move to somewhere that has less crime and internet access. But then he says, sorry, Enid, you don't have any model train stores. And what I love about this is that Okies everywhere this is cited online have gone to correct to make sure that the world knows that the Oklahoma Railroad Museum is in Enid. And so that episode was incorrect. So now you know. It also hosts the genius behind the international best-selling contemporary romance, Beautiful Disaster, Jamie McGuire. Jamie's first self-published bestseller was picked up by Atria Books in 2012 and movie rights to Beautiful Disaster were optioned by Warner Brothers in 2013. I hope you caught, I said, self-published, you guys. She is paving the way for the new adult genre with Beautiful Disaster's follow-up novel, Walking Disaster, debuting at number one on the New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestsellers lists as well. She also wrote the Providence series, Red Hill, A Beautiful Wedding, and Beautiful Oblivion, the first in the Maddox Brothers series, also a number one New York Times bestseller. She recently published Happenstance Novella series, a USA Today bestseller that is set in her hometown of Blackwell, Oklahoma. I actually got tired of saying New York Times bestseller so many times during your bio. Thank you so much for letting us come to your office today. Well, thanks for coming. Man, I mean, there's just so much to talk about, but I like to start with my guests at the very beginning. I know that you actually got a degree in radiology, right? So when did you decide, you know what, I want to be a writer. I want writing to be my full-time job and business. It wasn't until I could make a living being a writer before I, I was still working in the hospital when I made the New York Times and made my, uh, signed my first movie deal. Wow. So I still continued and people kept saying, the doctors in the ER were saying, why are you still here? And I said, you know, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. <laughs> right. So it was a long time before I felt like I could really make writing my full-time job. And were you, did you write as a child? Have you always been a writer? Is it, you know, that something you always thought you would do or did you kind of surprise yourself? No, I had no clue that I was going to write no novels. I've always written, but I... I'd had a, when I was in the third grade, I had a diary gifted to me for my birthday. And so I always uh, wrote in that, and then I continued writing in journals. And then in grade school, I always made like little comic book strips with dialogue, which is probably <laughs> why my books are so heavy in dialogue. And then as a high schooler, I would write plays and things like that. And then mm -hmm. as an adult, I blogged. But it wasn't mm -hmm. until my friend told me, hey, you should really consider writing a novel that I thought, oh yeah, I could probably do that. Wow. And yes, you did. <laughs> so I read in another interview that you said in your first month, Beautiful Disaster sold a hundred books. And then in the second month, it sold 30,000 copies. A so a day. what the heck did you do in that month? What happened? Like, how did that happen? It was because of a reader by the name of Nikki Eastup. I'll never forget her name. She mentioned my book in the Amazon romance forums and said, guys, you've got to read this book. And it was really word of mouth. I didn't pay a cent to advertise it. Wow. Uh, I'm always shocked to see how many people pay uh, on Facebook and things, these pa paid for posts, because that's just not something I did. But the environment was different back then. Mm -hmm. There wasn't so much competition. But yeah, it was all word of mouth. Hmm. People talking about it, whether they loved it, 
they either, it, Beautiful Disaster is really polarizing. They either really loved it or they really hated it, but either way they were talking about it. Wow. And so you started to get this momentum. You said you were still working at the hospital when you hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Mm -hmm. Now in my head, you know, everyone who's written a book that day, like, fireworks go off and suddenly millions of agents are calling you because you hit the list. Is that what it's like? What What is it like when you get to that point? Well, I had previously been, well, I was friends with E.L. James before she, uh, her book started really getting popular. Wow. And she had connected me with her agency. And so I already had an agent because I'd had foreign publishers calling me wanting mm. to, to translate my book. Oh, yeah. So I didn't have a lot of agents calling me because I already had an agent. So by the time the publisher started calling me, I was in a good spot to, to negotiate and, and speak to them. Did you decide on self-publishing at the beginning because of your relationship with E.L. James then? No, I started writing before E.L. James and I became friends. And I was friends with lots of authors, not just her. I uh, was friends with uh, Abby Glein and Colleen Hoover and Jessica Park and Tracy Garvis Graves. And a lot of us that, we weren't the first self-published authors, but we were first... Uh, authors that were hitting consistently, hitting the New York Times, and and uh, we were just doing things a little bit different. And I'm always proud, you know, to in that we were also supporting each other, and we were colleagues. We kind of had a little water cooler on on mm. Facebook, and and so that was really nice. So when you hit the New York Times bestsellers list, is that when Atria picked you up, or was it before or after, or how was, did that? It was just after. I remember hitting it, and Jessica Park called me, and she said, "Baby girl, you've." hit the New York Times, I had no idea because I didn't even know self-published authors could do that. I thought New York Times best-selling authors were from New York. I didn't know someone from Oklahoma <laughs> could do it. Right. So I was really excited and then, of course, people, the publisher started calling my my agent, trying to contact me. I didn't have, even have a website at the time, so they were contacting me on Facebook and <laughs> wow. saying, who do we need to talk to? So that was really fun. And then... Um, it just kind of went from there. Well, I wasn't going to sign with anyone, but because Warner Brothers had called and was wanting to sign a movie deal, my agent suggested that it would be better if, if we signed with someone. They would they would be more apt to sign me if I was with a, a publisher. So what is it like, because even myself, like anyone who writes a book, I think we all just idealize the idea of actually getting a publishing deal, you know? So was it sunshine and lollipops and all your dreams come true like we kind of think it is? Like I said, it never occurred to me that I would even sign with a publisher. It wasn't, I didn't start out with goals, uh, writing goals. I just thought I wanted other people besides my mom to read my book. <laughs> so I, I never sought out th seeking validation from a publisher. Like if, if I get a publishing deal, I'll be a real author. I was already an author in my mind. I was mm -hmm. already making the time, so I was already making it on my own. And I didn't feel like I needed that as validation. But... Um, when, when I did sign, I really picked who I felt the most connection with and who I really felt understood me as an author because I started out self-published. Um, I'm self-employed. I don't really like being told what to do. I like being my own boss and being on my own schedule. And clearly I knew what I was doing because I'd made it that far. So I really wanted someone that understood me as a self-published author and would work with me as a partner mm. instead of a boss employee type mm -hmm. of relationship and I really felt like Atria was that for me plus my editor at the time Amy Tannenbaum she we just really clicked and now she's my agent because she went on to be a literary mm -hmm. agent she's my agent now so we really really clicked <laughs> and that's why I picked Atria hmm. but then you went back to self-publishing yeah so tell us about that decision well I signed the first time with Atria and I signed with them again and it was a great experience I my books were on the shelves. It broadened my audience. They were great to me. They sent me on amazing book tours. I was able to learn more about the business, and I I can't say anything negative about Atri. I, I really enjoyed being with them for the time that I was with them. But it got to the point where uh, the industry, not Atria, but the industry shift. I wasn't seeing my books on the shelves as much, even during release week. I was on book tours and I was in airports and I wasn't seeing my books on the shelves. Mm -hmm. I was in bookstores and not seeing my books on the shelves. And then I, it was um, brought to my attention that I really needed to start pushing the print because they just weren't selling. And I'd asked, you know, is that just me or is that across the board? And they said, no, it's across the board. And I thought, well, that's kind of the whole reason why I signed with a publisher anyway. Mm -hmm. So it just really didn't make sense to me anymore. But, uh, you know, I still talk to the people at Atria. They're, I consider them good friends and mm -hmm. they've always been good to me and and I 
highly encourage anyone who has that opportunity to sign, especially with Adriel, because they taught me so much and they, they were so good to me while I was there. Let's go back. You mentioned, you know, at the beginning it was very organic and you had that fan who posted in forums. Mm -hmm. But as you worked your way, you know, to the New York Times bestsellers list, what were your strategies for growth? Because I'm sure you uh, started, you know, focusing and getting more strategic over time. I've really only used Twitter and Facebook. Wow. It wasn't until I could afford to do giveaways and I could afford to go to book signings. It was two years. My first book signing was during uh, after I published Walking Disaster, uh, well over two years after I published my first book. So I, it wasn't really book signings and it wasn't, uh, I just kept myself accessible to my fans on Facebook and talked to my readers and they did the rest for me. They told their friends. They. Uh, Beautiful Disaster is just a fun book to talk about, I guess. So people really like telling their friends about it and wanting their friends to read it because then they could talk to them and discuss it with them. So It is, by the way, everyone. I'm obsessed <laughs> because right before the interview, I was like, nah, I'll read some of it just so I can talk to her about it. And then I was up all night freaking finishing it. <laughs> so get it. It's good. Um, so now that you know it's your whole own show, let's talk about what that really works like a business. Do you have a team of employees? You know, um, do you have to plan all of your book tours and everything yourself? What is it like now? Well, I've scaled it back, obviously, because I'm not a huge corporation. So I've, I've scaled it back. I have. I don't go to as many book signings. I'm kind of at, at a different point in my life where you know my kids are still little, so I want to stay home more. I, I feel like um, self-publishing is a little more laid back. I pick my own schedule and I, you know, I obviously I'm not going to make it, uh, even though I have back-to-back -back releases, I feel yeah. like it's more relaxed. So um, I do have a team of an editor, beta readers, a cover designer, and uh, so I work with those freelancers and together we make the finish. When you have like book tours or promotions, I'm just thinking about like promoting it all on your own now. I guess those people kind of help you and then your readers spread the word. Well, I just feel really lucky in that when I first started, there wasn't the competition there is now. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a really polarizing book that people love or hate like to talk about. I had a group of friends who we all talked about our books and we all read each other's books. And we sincerely talked about each other's books, not as, hey, let's get together so we can promote each other. It was, we're friends and we really enjoy each other's books and we talked about it. And then, and then you know, I signed with a publisher and that brought my audience. And now I'm back to self-publishing. I have a, a, a established audience now that, mm -hmm. that they, they love to support me. And I have, that was one thing that my editor, Amy, at, when she was my editor at Atria, she said, you know, I've never seen fans like yours, your, your readers are rabid. They're so passionate about your books. And I, I've really never known it to be any other way, but I, you know, I love it. I'm so yeah. grateful that they That's are so awesome. passionate about them because they help me so much. Right. Now, a couple times you've mentioned your schedule, which this was one of the craziest things. And I love it because it, it's a perfect example of designing your own life and how much hustle it really takes. You guys are going to freak out. So tell people what an average 24 hours is like or your average day is like. Okay. Well, I won't start at 8 o'clock in the morning because I'm usually going to bed then. So I wake up um, by the time the kids get out of school and then we do our regular family evening. We eat dinner and discuss our days and we get the kids bathed and in bed and, or homework or whatever and then that's when my work day begins. I start about 10 or 11 o'clock at night and then I write all night until it's time to get the kids up for school and then I I go to bed. I, sometimes I play with the baby for a couple hours, depends on how tired I am. And then I go to bed and sleep until they get out of school and then start all over again. Wow, that is so cool and so crazy. Has that had an effect like on your family life, on your social life? You're basically living, living a flopped schedule. Yeah, well, you know how it is. I mean, it, to, to schedule this, we had to do it in the afternoon because mm -hmm. I sleep all day. So it is hard during the week, especially to, to have appointments or if I need to make phone calls uh, because people are usually still either getting ready for work or just waking up whenever I'm going to bed. So it kind of makes real life difficult, but <laughs> I enjoy having that time. It's uninterrupted time to write and time by myself, and then I still get my family life. Mm -hmm. as well. So. so cool. So looking back, everything from the very beginning of, you know, starting to write with the intention to self-publish, maybe before Beautiful Disaster went big, but um, all the way to now, what would you say is the best and the worst part 
of being a full-time author. The best part is picking my own schedule and the time I get to spend with my family. When I was working in the hospital, there were times that I missed soccer games or mm -hmm. teacher conferences because I just couldn't be there. And now, uh, being self-employed, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I can pick off a week or two weeks if I want to. Mm -hmm. And it really just depends on what my, my own schedule that I pick for myself is and how hard I want to work. It's the worst. The worst thing about self-publishing is it's the industry is changing so fast it's nothing like it was you know almost four years ago when I started you there's an uncertainty and it shows there's a competition and maybe where uh, we should be banding together sometimes there's competition gets in the way of that but also it, it's there's just an uncertainty we just don't know there's so many contributing factors to success and they change all the time so there's always this uh, underlying uncertainty among everyone where where's the industry going to go next because mm -hmm. it's been the same way for 50 plus years 60 plus years so and, and now every day is different you just mm -hmm. don't know what to expect and what about just like being a full-time author because I would have guessed that you would say that I mean, maybe this just shows that I'm sensitive, but, you know, would be reviews, like terrible. People just seem to, with fiction especially, it seems like people just think they have a free reign to just rip you apart. So I would have guessed if you were to say the worst part would be terrible critics. Well, I don't but... read reviews anymore. I oh, used well, to. Well, that's probably smart. <laughs> and they, they used to make me cry. And I remember a night um, in January three years ago where I curled up in, in a ball and said I just didn't want to do it anymore. Because mm -hmm. they don't just review you poorly. They talk about, they, they make it personal. People get really personal about books. They feel offended personally if they don't like something that you've written that they disagree with. And, the, you know, I've had people say they, uh, my husband beats me, that they feel sorry for my children for having a mother like me. It's not just critical wow. negative reviews because everyone's a reviewer and everyone's a critic now with the internet that just gives them access to, the, to not only do that, but it also gives them access to you and anonymously. So mm. pe people, you know, tend to get vicious. But I just, I don't read them anymore because I started noticing that it was affecting my writing. So mm. I stopped. So, so one thing I thought was interesting, I know as a reader, I can get just caught up in, you know, like when I was reading your book, I just get caught up in it, especially when I'm like binge reading like that. <laughs> you know, so I find myself, you know, kind of in a daze thinking about that when I'm back with my family or back in the real world. And I thought that that must be a challenge when you're the one creating the world. Like, how do you separate and just shut off your writing until 10 p.m. and then turn it back on all night long? Well, it's a process. I mean, I like to check my Facebook and talk to my friends. And, and whenever I feel like that's all wrapped up, then I then I can start. Or I'll listen to music for a while and get me in the mood. Or I'll just say, okay, it's time to work and I've got to be a big girl and just do it. What If I waited until I was in the mood or until I was inspired, then nothing would ever get done. Mm. So I just know that has to be done, so I do it. And what about the the part where you're taking you know your creation and its creativity, and now it's a business? Has there what's been maybe your biggest hurdle in you know having your writing as a business, and how did you get over that? Well, like I said, I was pretty lucky in the beginning. I came in at just the right time. So my biggest hurdle as a business would be taxes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. I, I, I might I, edit that out. <laughs> I mean, I just, I really, I really, you know, I, I'm, I have an established fan base and they support me and they, um, like we were talking earlier, you know, I, I don't just have readers that just buy my books. They buy every version of my foreign editions because they like to collect the covers yeah, and they buy so my cool. audio books and they're proud to stand there and say, I own every format of Jamie McGuire books because they don't just see us as authors anymore. You know, we, we carry this personality. We're, we're personalities on, mm -hmm. on Facebook and social media. And, and a lot of them are writing themselves, so they look up to us. And I just, I, it, it, I don't want to say it hasn't been hard for me because it, it has been. It's, you have to work every day at mm -hmm. it. But um, as a business, I just kind of let it grow organically. Are, let's imagine, you know, that you just mentioned that your fans are also aspiring writers. Same and I'm that. sure a lot of writers out there would love to just sit down with you and pick your brain. What would you tell that writer who's at the beginning? Maybe they're working on their first book or they only have a couple books out um, and they're struggling or discouraged or just trying to get started. What would your best advice for them be? Well, if they're just starting, my 
advice is always to finish your book. You, you can't you can't really be an author until you finish your book. You have to finish it. You, you can't learn. You can't continue to grow unless you finish that first hurdle. You have to finish your book first. You can't say, well, you know, I'm, I'm writing and can I have advice? No, the advice starts whenever you finish your book. Hmm. Then, then you, you perfect your craft. If you're a couple books in, uh, just keep going. Just keep writing. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Hmm. Now, you talk about writing and finishing. Let's talk about that a little bit because you just mentioned how you work more now than you actually did when you were employed. A lot more. Now. Um, you know, did that, did you have to like work that muscle, your discipline muscle, I guess, to get your books finished and to get the work ethic that you have now? I learned a lot of that at Atria whenever, for the first time I had deadlines that I was working against mm-hmm. and I learned just how much I could write in a night or in a day. And if I was really under the line, just how far I could push myself and that I can do it. So I learned that at Atria, but I, yeah, I, I work twice as much cause I'm always working. If it's, on social media or I'm answering questions or I'm updating my website or making images or talking to my freelancers or whatever I'm doing. I might get to go to soccer games, but I'm on my phone talking, emailing, you know, always working, Mm -hmm. always working and on vacation, on weekends, holidays, Christmas. I'm checking my Facebook to make sure that none of my readers need anything or they they're asking questions or I need to answer my editor. Mm-hmm. So I'm always working. So you mentioned that they had helped you with setting deadlines. And I read that you have these crazy goals for the next few years of a few releases every year, 2015, 2016, 2017. So is that a creative decision because you have all these ideas? Or is that a strategic decision because you want to, like, financially? Or is it both? It's both. Okay. It's both. I, I have ideas. Red Hill, when I wrote that, I had that in my head for three years. And now, just like we were talking about, I know that I can write faster. I do, and I can get all these books out. But a lot of it is um, I have a franchise in Beautiful Disaster, and the readers want these books, and I want to get them in their hands. You know, I, I know I have the ideas. I know what I'm going to write. I just want to get them in their hands. But also, you know, I wrote six works between June and December last year, so I know I can do it. And it's what everybody else is doing, so you have to keep up. Hmm. You, you can't write one book a year anymore. Not even the bigger authors are doing that. So it, you really, if you want to keep up and you want to stay in the mind of your readers, you need to write that often just yeah. to compete. Wow. Well, thank you so much for telling us all this. What is your, I want to make sure everyone knows, what is your upcoming title that you have coming out or your, or your next series or your next big project? I'm working on Beautiful Sacrifice. Right now it's the second brother, it's the second book in the Maddox Brothers series. And I've got a lot more after that. You can just check my website. and has a list of all my upcoming works, jamiemcguire.com. Awesome. Okay, well, when we come back, we are going to play a quick game of Guess Who. I think you guys are going to love it. So right after this. I found Jamie McGuire so impressive. So I want to pull out a few key takeaways for you to make sure that you got them from the interview. First, create something interesting. It might be easy to say, oh, well, she just stumbled into success after writing her book. No, her book is polarizing and a little bit shocking. Now, it's not E.L. James or anything, but I mean, it's not just a ho-hum book. Is your book or business or blog or product, is it memorable? Is it something people are going to talk about? Next, don't wait for outside validation. I gotta be honest, this one's a little bit hard for me because I would feel pretty validated if a network picked up my show, right? But I thought it was so interesting that she said, I was an author whether or not I was published. Do you believe in what you're doing? Do you feel like you are who you say you are and you've created what you say you've created? Whether or not anyone brings in outside validation, I thought that was awesome. Next, focus on your audience one person at a time. We heard this with Crystal Payne and with Donald Miller that they were focused on helping that one person at the beginning. And you need to do the same thing. We need to be thinking about that one person in our audience who we can help today. That is something all of us can do and it will lead to growth. Next, success takes serious work. I hope you appreciated her crazy schedule and her work ethic. Even if someone were to just stumble into success, which no one does, but if there was some sort of overnight success, you better believe that person has to work their tail off to stay relevant and stay on top of things. So there is no shortcut as much as we hate to say it. And also, don't be afraid to be a little bit weird with your work ethic. 
Do you think her family and friends at first thought it was normal that she worked overnight? Probably not. But that's what it was worth it to her to keep writing the books that she had inside her. I thought that was awesome. She has generously offered to give away all her self-publishing knowledge on a page on her website, which we've linked in the show notes for this episode. So if you're interested in writing fiction and self-publishing, be sure and check that out. She's also generously offered to give away two signed copies of her newest book. So be sure and go to the pursuit.tv slash apply to enter to win those. Now, before we announce last week's winner, it's time for that extra dose of encouragement with a segment called, if they can make it, If you have a product idea, you're going to love today's segment because I present to you the plastic wishbone. At Thanksgiving, if you guys were sad that only two of you could find a wishbone and make a wish, now everyone can because they've made a plastic version. Now this seems a little bit crazy to me, like making fabric four leaf clovers or something because do you think your wish is really gonna come true if your wishbone is plastic but hey they make 30,000 wishbones a day and they pull in 2.5 million dollars a year so their wish obviously came true if you have a crazy product idea and people come to you in your life and say that'll never work just show them the plastic wishbone and say if they can make it So we are going to play a game of Guess Who? And in this stack, which I've not yet seen either, there are characters from books or movies, and we can't say the character name or the story name, and we can't say any other characters, but we can say anything else. And uh, we'll see who gets the most in 30 seconds. And Jamie has generously offered to give away a signed hard cubby. <laughs> Jamie has generously offered to give away a signed hardcover copy of Beautiful Redemption. And if I win, she's gonna give away two. If she wins, then she only has to give away one. So, we are going, we each get 30 seconds to see who can get the most. On my mark, get set, go. Uh, pass. And if we pass a bunch, we're editing it out. <sighs> pass, who wrote these? Okay, um, oh boy. All right, a bad guy with little, who's green, with little sticks coming out of his head. On either side. Mickey Martian. Um, tall, man-like, old-timey, <laughs> old-timey monster guy. Bride of Frankenstein? Yes, okay. So that's the first word, and then the second word is like a scary thing. I Frankenstein? Frankenstein. I'm gonna give myself that. These are hard. <laughs> oh, okay, this one is easy. Um, oh, I can't say any other character names. Uh, detective and England, he's British, British detective. Um, um, I know. I'm terrible at this. Uh, um, Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Okay, creepy smile cartoon. Cheshire Cat. Um, lightning scar. Harry Potter. Uh, mm, I don't think I can, okay. A large place filled with different kinds of candies. Willy Wonka. Yeah. Um, oh, the, uh, <laughs> okay. The guy, so, wizard, white hair, long white hair. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Gandalf. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> another detective, female. Uh, Stephanie Kwan. Old timey-ish. Uh, in that the stories are old-ish. I mean, they're old. Yeah, my mom read these books. Um, yeah, like her and her uh, friends Anne, go solve mysteries. Um, not Anne. Um, pass. No. Um, tall, lanky, old cartoon, Disney cartoon. They, um, long nose. He was nerdy, but he wanted the girl. Old Disney cartoon. Old Disney cartoon. Old not, Disney. not popular. I know, I'm trying to think back. Um, his last name also is a large construction tool to pick things up, to help build skyscrapers, to, uh, Pass. I have no idea. <laughs> Ichabod Crane. Oh. Um, okay, so, um, a husband is a, what's his first, uh, before his name, you're gonna say? Mr. Okay, and then the, the car, it's a nice car, everybody wants one by the time they're 40. 
it's not a BMW, but a... No, I'm trying to think of names. Uh, also Spanish name. Girl's name. Spanish girl's name, a car, a really nice car. A Spanish car. BMW. Um, Porsche. Um, Lexus. I'm trying to think of cars now, which I'm totally stumped. It was my Spanish name in Spanish class. <laughs> that, I guess I will have to pass if those are the clues you're giving me. Mr. Mer okay. Mercedes. Oh, um, dang it. Pass. Um, pass. Um, Good, you're making me feel better about my Pass. pass. I don't know what that is. Oh, this is, um, oh, okay, so I can't say, um, it's a flower and someone who stays alive. Oh. Oh. Popular movie. Yes. Someone who stays alive. Um, beautiful flower. Think of a beautiful flower. But number Rose. one top flower. Rose. Okay. Yes. And uh, this is a character, a sister in a popular YA novel. Okay. Twilight. Or... May the odds ever be in your favor. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but who is... Rose is a is that Rose is the it's name a, of the it's person? A sister. It's a sister, and it's um, it, it, you're blank and proper. You're Primrose. Yes. And prior, her. prior, Primrose Everdeen. Everdeen. Yes. I was close. Prior is uh, the other one. The virgin. <laughs> um, okay. Um, frankly, he doesn't give a damn about her. Gone with the wind. The Scarlet O'Hara. Yes. And uh, he'll never grow up. Peter Pan. Yes. Okay, well, let's count before we turn off the camera. Okay, so. Oh, you're good. Go ahead. Turn it back on. Okay, so let's see. One. You got three. That passed a lot, so it's not really fair. <laughs> yeah, well, you got quite a bit more than three, but. I feel like I win because I got you to guess more. <laughs> That's true. So That's we're true. gonna call. To I'm pass. gonna go with me <laughs> being the winner. <laughs> so thank you so much again. This You're was welcome. awesome. I feel like writers are gonna learn so much from this interview. So make sure to check out Jamie on JamieMcGuire.com and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Instagram also. Last week, Donald Miller generously gave away a copy of his newest book, Scary Close, and a bundle of PDFs to help your business. And the winner of that giveaway is Brandon Spencer. If you enjoyed today's show and you want to enter to win Jamie McGuire's giveaway, be sure and share about the show on social media and tune in next week to see if you won. I'm Kelsey Humphreys. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Pursuit.